Okay, thank you, Matthew. Hey, everybody. Last session of the day, five o'clock. This is called dedication, so I'm really, really grateful to see people in the room right now. Um, we're going to be having a bit of a, a conversation in the middle um, of this session. I gave this, uh, well, it's not exactly the session because we won't know until the end how similar it is to how I've done it before, but I gave this session in Amsterdam and in the middle I actually want to have a chat and um, we have one microphone, so I'm wondering if it's not too much of an inconvenience to you all, would you be willing to huddle a little bit in that middle section so that it would be easy to pass that microphone around so that we can have a bit more of a chat and that the recording later um, has, uh, you know, has what you're saying rather than me having to necessarily repeat everything. I will repeat things that for people who can't get to the microphone so we don't have to wait too much. But um, yeah, that'd be really that'd be really cool. So thank you. Um, you know, if you don't want to participate in that um, conversation, then obviously you don't need to huddle at the microphone. But I just wanted to you know give you an opportunity to to do that before we kind of got into it. Okay. So my name is Donna Benjamin. I'm also known as Catacrab on Twitter and on Drupal.org um, and at Gmail. Uh, so if you want to um, continue to have this conversation with me, then um, you can find me using Catacrab. Constructive conflict resolution, huh? Hmm. So conflict is human nature, really. Although not exclusively human. Cats and dogs are somewhat famous enemies, right? But it kind of underscores that conflict is a fairly natural process. We have a, a natural biological response to conflict. Flight or fight, the adrenaline response. Adrenaline courses through our blood and forces us to choose that fight or flight mechanism. Or in some cases, freeze, the kind of rabbits in the headlight approach. <gasps> What do I do? I can't make my choice. Natural. Conflict is natural. But conflict isn't just war. When many people think about conflict, they think about real violence, you know, blood on the streets, wars. Uh, but it's often, it's often much smaller, uh, stems from often simple misunderstandings or, or a fear of speaking up. A lot of conflict begins with unmet or unexpressed needs, right? I mentioned flight or fight, but there are some other common responses to, to conflict. It's easier to walk away, to give up. So avoidance is a, is a common response, but I'd say it's not a constructive response. Avoidance tends to help um, avoidance tends not to help us build a better solution. So it's a really natural thing. I was like, I really just, I'd really rather just not know about this. I really just would rather walk away. These people are yelling at each other. I'm going to walk away. I, I, I can't deal with this, this criti criticism that I'm getting. I just want to walk away. So just this sense of, of, of avoidance. But it's, again, in that really natural response to, um, to conflict in the, the fight or flight or freeze, this is one of the kind of common ones. And so one of the things I'm thinking about is how do we kind of check those natural responses and work towards constructive responses? That's one of my questions. Another one is denial. Just try to pretend it isn't happening. It's not even that you're backing away. It's just like, just don't acknowledge that that's an issue. Not happening, not on my radar. Denying there's a problem doesn't move the issue forward. It doesn't help anyone construct a solution, right? So denial, yes, another really natural response. So there's nothing wrong with it, right, in that sense. Like we can't escape our biology. The fight, that adrenaline response and the way we naturally want to respond to conflicts, these are natural responses. Our, as some people like to say our lizard brain, right, our amygdala. We just have these natural responses to conflict. And again, trying to find the constructive way forward isn't necessarily the groove we naturally want to kind of rock to. Does that even make sense? I don't think it does. 
All right. Um, it's not a game. Like, conflict is, is, is for real. And we also have a lot of things like, you know, Battleship, where we play around with, with ideas, you know, the underpinning ideas of conflict, but it's not a game. Though many people will treat conflict as a game, or you find, you may have heard the thing, oh, that, they're just game players. They're kind of pushing people's buttons, right? So some people do get into conflict as though it is a game. But if you've seen the classic movie War Games, you may remember that the only way to play to win is is not to play. So if we can try and stop the game playing around conflict, we might be able to move forward to something more constructive. So I have this kind of I just wanted to pause a moment to think about the historical nature of conflict. I mean really History is the story of conflict, right? We, we, we kind of, um, our, our human stories are, are filled with tales of war and conquest. If you think about kind of an historical timeline, right, they're often punctuated by, you know, invasions and revolutions and beheadings and, you know, these kinds of things. That this is something that's kind of part of um, the way we even think about our own humanity, and where we've come from, and even where we might be going, the threats of war and conflict. And we've had various ways of resolving conflicts. Some have tried building walls in various places at various times with various effects, or building arsenals of missiles. You know, what was that? You know, the, the threat of mutually assured destruction was, was a way of avoiding conflict, apparently. Or perhaps in, in courtrooms. Resolving conflict in courts is something that, you know, it's a daily, it's a, it's a, it's a huge industry, right? The legal profession. But uh, I'd argue that this is not constructive resolution of conflict either. There's usually a winner, which means... There's also usually a loser, right? So whilst it's a less bloody way of resolving a conflict, I don't know that it's necessarily building a constructive solution to whatever that issue was. So conflict. To me, really, challenge is at the heart of conflict. And I believe, and this is, I guess, my key premise here, is that accepting that challenge is, is the key to constructive resolution, to say, if someone presents, if or a pair of people or groups of people present with some kind of conflict, then underlying that is some kind of challenge which represents an opportunity for positive change. Or maybe it's remo a change which is a removal of something which is causing angst and grief and, and trouble, right? It, but it's an opportunity for change of one sort or another, which really should be positive, have the opportunity to be positive, to recognise that if trouble is, is, is being generated, then there might be some cause, underlying cause to that trouble, which is um, going to be a useful clue to fixing something really, um, really meaningful. We, we need to explore and test and challenge ideas. And I really like this quote. And, and, you know, I think Einstein is held up as this person of, uh, you know, great genius. But um, I think this idea is really useful here when thinking about conflict as well, as well, that we can't solve the problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we, when we created them. And to really, again, get to that heart of what is the challenge here? Can we test the ideas, blow apart the assumptions that we're bringing to the table? They might be right, but if we don't question them, then we don't know. So sometimes these ideas compete and we need some mechanism to rub those ideas up against each other, I guess, in a way that causes something useful to come out of it, to perhaps improve those ideas by, um, by that competition. So really, what is conflict? And this is where I, I want us to try and have a bit of a conversation. The reality is it, it really does mean very different things to different people. Um, and I think that that difference is at the heart of why conflict 
um, is, is, is actually valuable. Um, that difference is why diversity matters, that it's because we have different perspectives on what any given solution might look like that means we get an opportunity to improve that solution. So what is it? And this is where I'm going to turn to you and see if we can have a little bit of a conversation. It's different things to different people. And we've got a range of different people here in the room. So I'm hoping we might be able to explore this idea a little and come to a kind of common, um, a common sense just in the room today of what conflict means to us who are here. So who's going to be brave and grab the mic and have a go? What do you think? What is conflict? What does it mean to you? The flip side is maybe you have an example of a kind of conflict to illustrate what it means to you. You might have a story. Yeah, please come and huddle up so we can have a chat. All right, well, since I'm going to be the first to leave because I have to catch a train, I'll be the first to <laughs> present my thoughts on that. Uh, can you I just let us know your name too? Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm Rick, Rick Pine. I, Hi, I'm, Rick. I'm actually a local. <laughs> that matters. Um, to me, a conflict is kind of a, a difference of opinion. A difference of opinion. Right? Yep. Is, that, is that all you were looking for? Yeah, no, okay. I, I mean, it's not elaborate all I'm looking for. It's exactly well, right. But yeah, please elaborate. Well, I, I just wanted to, I guess, add to that that I, I liked what you said about a conflict is actually underlying. It's it's a challenge, and, and that is, in fact, the reason that is the challenge is how are you going to come to some agreement about a difference of opinion? And, uh, yeah, I run into that a lot, which is why I decided to attend this. So I look forward to hearing what other people have to say about that. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Max Bronsma, I, I, I like what you said earlier about um, a difference in needs. So uh, often you can be talking about the same thing, and the same solution will work, but no, they don't. You don't know what each other's needs are, so you can't use the right language. So it feels conflict um, laden. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's that's right. Yep. A couple of things. One is there is another way to deal with conflict in addition to the ones you listed, one that is very damaging to the self, that's surrender. Yes. But to me, conflict seems to ultimately be a difference in worldview caused partly because each and every one of us in this room, outside of this room, my cats at home who have conflicts with each other, each one of us lives inside our own head. Ultimately, each and every sentient creature has a different and unique worldview. Acknowledging that, accepting that there are different worldviews, that different worldviews are a strength of our species, can help us deal with conflict, but they are also the different worldviews are the source of all conflict. Great, thank you. I didn't catch your name. Valerie Griffin. Valerie Griffin, thank you. I mean, I think that's that's absolutely right. That sense of worldview, and thanks for bringing up surrender. Um, it's definitely another another response to wave that white flag. And yep, yep, thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Damon Lowney, and um, I'm going to use a somewhat specific example that's going on with our site. So on the front end and what the public sees, it's really great and we also have a really hardworking team. Um, but at the same time, uh, one of our other in-house developers, which is not you know the team that built our website, he's more of our guy who just maintains things. Um, and I'm not a technical person, like extreme, you know, I'm kind of like right in the middle, probably more on the green side of things. But uh, the membership database is extremely complicated and has many different moving parts. And um, we can never seem to get it working quite right. And our in-house guy who doesn't specialize in Drupal, he specializes in some other programs, Cold Fusion or, or something like that. Um, you know, he keeps, he, he, he'll say things, you know, like trying to code in, in Drupal with at least the membership database side is like trying to 
code with boxing gloves to, to get to do what he wanted to do. And so for our organization, it's kind of, you know, I'm trying to keep both sides happy and I can tell that he's getting exas exasperated. And yeah. So. so what do you think is his underlying challenge? Well, I know that, you know, uh, the company he works for did bid on the website. And, you know, there was all sorts of different political sort of pieces that go together and that come along with associations. Um, but, you know, we, we like having him on the team a lot. You know, it's you know, he's been part of the team for a long time. So I think he just wants it to work right, and I, I, I think he just is getting frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, frustration is a real is an often a real cause, so I, I guess – yeah, the the challenge for you is, guys yeah. is to really get at the heart of that frustration and see where and how it could be mitigated. Um, yeah. You know, does it mean is is there something that it's a is it, it is is it his learning journey that is frustrating because he doesn't yeah, have the skills that he possibly, needs? Possibly, yeah. He, he he's catching on pretty quickly with with uh, with Drupal, um, but I guess it's just not his platform. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So what he's he's, familiar with. he's being asked to swim in an environment that. That's not natural to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that really illustrates yet another kind of element to it, right? Is it's not necessarily a an obvious um, fight going on, but someone is, you know, just yeah. really struggling with the the broader environment, and that causes that has a ripple effect on all of the people around him because, you know, he can't play the game in 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 the way that everybody else is. So he's got a natural, you know, a natural yep, yep. unmet need to be able to really collaborate yeah. and it sounds like you alluded to there might have been some some sort of political hurt feelings about not having had Perhaps, yeah. his that option chosen as well a little bit more you know, yeah he still does a lot of work for us just you know he'll uh attach it to the website you know build a page using his um programs cool. you know, when we need to yeah right nice and quick and, and get it so out there. Um, as we go through the rest of the presentation, there's a few tools at the end and, and they might be something to look up and see if that's going to help resource you to be able to um, address some of, those, some of those challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Cheryl Schmalls. Hi, Cheryl. And conflict uh, for me is when my expectations don't match my reality. Yeah, <laughs> beautifully, beautifully <laughs> succinct. When my expectations don't meet my reality. Yeah, sorry, Dan. Yeah, well, my expectations don't meet my reality, and I think that's really that's a nice sums it up. That's tweetable, as they say. <laughs> oh, thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on on conflict that they wanna wanna share? Yeah, please. Uh, my name is Tim Nafziger, and along with working with Drupal, I've been part of an organization uh, called Christian Peacemaker Teams that specializes in in some of these areas. I'd like to talk to you later. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk. Um, so. When I think about conflict, to elaborate on something you said earlier about the health of conflict, right. I think it's also important to acknowledge the role conflict plays in change processes. Um, you haven't given any specifics, but you know, bringing Symphony on into the Drupal uh, in Drupal eight caused a lot of conflict, and that's that's a part of a change process. And um, you know, building ownership of a change process is about conflict resolution as well. So I just think there's a lot of very interesting pieces we could mine there around. Uh, change in organizations and change in systems. Yes, thank you. Um, very, very useful. And that change management is a whole field of how do you actually address the conflict that bringing change in. And I don't think we've got those pieces in the community about how we respond and deal with stuff. So would really like to bring that on board. You know about the conflict resolution and community working group stuff. And yeah, yeah great. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Matthew. Matthew Saunders. Um, to me, conflict is a collision of opinions, ideas, or understanding that creates disagreement and often anger. Very nice. Say that again. A collision of opinions, ideas, or understanding that creates disagreement and often anger. Yep. I like that. Anyone, anyone want to respond to that as a, as a kind of nice little definition of the having summed up a few of the things that have been said? Yeah, seeing some nods. Anyone got anything else they want to add before we kind of move on a little? 
Okay. So um, apologies to people watching this recording after the fact now. What I'd actually like to do is have you um, have a quick chat with someone um, beside you and share, just share an example of a, of a conflict that may be a work or a, or a personal or a community or whatever, and just um, identify what the quickly what that conflict was and whether or not there was a, re- a resolution, whatever that may have been, and whether you felt that it was a constructive or not kind of solution. So I think I just want to kind of get that those ideas bubbling and have some things in mind as we go forward. Um, so just, you know, wherever you happen to be, just turn to the person who's nearest and just have a quick chat. I just want to, I just want to have a little bit more bandwidth than, than me talking at you. <laughs> Okay, we probably don't have time for a report back from everyone, but um, if you if you do, if maybe we could just get a couple of quick report backs on any insights or revelations that people might have had out of that conversation. Anyone want to grab the mic and, and share a, a quick thought out of those conversations? <laughs> um, we, we probably don't have we don't have time for a report back from every single little conversation but I does anyone have any kind of moments of inspiration or revelation that they want to kind of share back with the with the poor people who've been wondering what's been going on for the past five minutes on the recording yeah you have to use the mic yeah yeah thank you um, I'd probably say communication is probably key here because, you know, we have two sides, you know, to our, our, our web presence and, uh, you know, they're they're probably not communicating as their, I guess, their issues that they have with, you know, the whole system as, as a whole. 
right. um, to each other as, as well as they could be, and nor have I, um, <laughs> as well as I could. So, communication, communication. getting clearer, uh, building clarity around what's being communicated and how it's being communicated. Exactly. Nice. Thank you. Okay. So, one of the other things that um, I think is is a really important sort of facet of this of this issue as a whole is um, is culture. The different ways we approach conflict is really is often quite quite cultural. And when we're only um, operating in a in a single culture or our own culture, it's sometimes harder to see that. Um, when we come up against a very obviously different culture and we see that, you know, these people are responding in different ways, it becomes more obvious. But even within our own culture, we can still um, come with different assumptions. Our, you know, our individual families may have different ways of operating. We may have learned different ways of responding to conflict from our families, from the patterns of, of, of the generations that came before us. So it's very cultural. I think it's also very gendered. Like, you know, di- again, different cultures will have degrees of how much this um, this impacts, but, you know, men and women will respond differently to conflict. Um, w- there are horrible stats about, you know, the n- violence in general in, in our community being predominantly um, acted by one gender on another. So, you know, there are... Um, there are some elements in there that it really pays to be aware of and to just kind of check sometimes when dealing with conflict and having a response to them. These things are not always easy to understand either. When I go back to our, you know, our amygdala, our natural responses, our natural response is to respond and not necessarily take a step, take a breath and be mindful about that response. So it's not always easy. And I think one of the other ones, which perhaps is less over, you know, less generally understood, um, is is authority and our relationship with authority is how we respond to conflict. Like if someone in a position of authority to you tells you to do something, your um, your natural inclination to do what they said is going to depend on that authoritative relationship, right? And um, and this is one where, um, as an Australian. Uh, we tend to have a much um, a shorter what they call a power ratio index. Like our respect for authority is somewhat famously pretty non-existent. <laughs> um, and so if I'm given an order by someone in authority and I have reason to um, distrust or think that's wrong in some way, I'm likely to say so. Um, one of the uh, amplifications of this is... Um, this is really crazy anecdote, but Qantas pilots um, have, and also actually New Zealanders are even better at this than Australians, but that Qantas pilots have been notoriously um, uh, questioning of command when it's been wrong. And, and it, at some point someone did research and identified that this was actually one of the underlying reasons for Qantas's safety record. The flip side of it was research was done on why I can't remember which, but I think it may have been a Korean airline. Um, their uh, black box recorders stuff found that, yes, the, the pilot had actually made terrible mistakes and none of um, that pilot's uh, second in, in command were um, willing to overtly say, hey, that's a dumb thing, don't do that. They, But they could hear in the coded responses that, the sense that, the, that others thought it was wrong, but they all went down with that plane because they weren't willing to, um, they weren't, they just couldn't um, reject his authority. I mean, that's a tragic, that's a tragic amplification and the entire airline industry changed as a result of understanding that power distance ratio and that dynamic. So that I think is also a good example out of tragedy to show that we can check our natural responses when we become aware of what they are likely to be. Maybe I'm an optimist, but I think I think there's some kind of positive positivity out of that that we've now got a much much safer. Um, although this past year, perhaps something else is going on, but you know that we actually have a much safer airline industry because of that understanding. But I think one of the other parts of that is if you are going to um, reject a command from authority, that that needs to be done with respect. 
But I'd say respect is even bigger than that. Respect is actually at the real heart of, of the way I've been thinking about constructive conflict resolution. That we have to respond with respect no matter what that response is going to be. In most martial arts, we start with a bow. We might be about to kick the shit out of each other, but we're going to start with this very deep um, action and symbol of respect. It's showing respect to our opponent and it's putting respect front and centre when we're about to, when we disagree with each other. It's like, I'm about to, you know, really do you some damage, hopefully, because I'm going to win this fight. But I'm, you know, we say, we start with respect and it's crucial. And I say that it's also, there's two sides to it. It's um, not just a kind of abstract sense of respect, but it's to be respectful, but also to feel respected, that it's coming back the other way. To build this kind of bridge of, of trust is that respect is on both sides, is held in both sides. Now, I'm kind of... Um, enjoyed Drees's keynote this morning and, and he, he actually had this quote um, as I think he, one of his lessons this morning was that honest disagreement is often a good sign of progress. And, and again, I think that just kind of amplified to me this journey that I've been on about looking at constructive conflict resolution and that this sense that challenge um, and disagreement is a useful thing and this sense that it's a good sign of progress really kind of like was a bell ringing of resonation for me this morning. It's like, yes, that's, that's the case. Um, if we don't have disagreement, we're probably not really moving. You know, this is a sense of progress. And the thing about having a disagreement is doing it in, a, in an environment of, of trust that you can disagree with someone but still be able to have a useful, productive, friendly, um, collegiate relationship with them that we can agree, you know, they all uh, agree to disagree perhaps and move on but that we can disagree respectfully to get at the heart, to find the challenge and address it in a way that's constructive, that brings the, the, the project, the patch, the relationship, whatever, whatever that kind of context to conflict is, that we acknowledge what's at the heart of it and, and can move forward. Trust that we can find common ground. I think that's the real key sometimes. Like one, in my work in the community working group, the, the most upsetting to me as the kind of mediator is when I can't get um, people to at least to the table even to explore what it is that's at the heart of their disagreement. When they just turn around and just, you know, they can't even find the, a little bit of trust to try. So trusting that we can find common ground if we try, I think is this next part. So we have respect and trust. We should have mutual goals and values, especially if we bring this back to the context of the Drupal community. We all want Drupal to be awesome, right? And if you don't, then I think you're at the wrong conference. Right? So there's some assumptions that we, you know, we make that mean let's hope that you know, we, can, we can find that, that common ground, that mutual goals and, and mutual values. But ultimately, I think if you've got respect and trust, there's another, um, another corner to the triangle that we need, and that's compassion. Sometimes you can't find a really useful solution and you have to be really compassionate about the person who's bringing their grievance to you. You may not be able to solve their challenge. It may be real and, and egregious and just a really hard problem, but that doesn't mean that they're wrong or that their voice shouldn't be heard or that their, you know, their challenge shouldn't be understood. So to bring that sense of compassion and understanding is really important. The flip side is maybe they need to bring some compassion to the table and understand the damage they're doing. Maybe they need to build a sense of compassion and put, put different shoes on and see that the behaviour that, you know, they're kind of railing with is, is, is problematic. But that's, that's a hard row as well. But I, I kind of feel that these are the three things, like trust, um, respect and compassion really get you a long way to that sitting at the table and finding those common goals to find a solution to put challenge and, and conflict 
on the table in a useful way rather than necessarily just walking away from it. I talked before about there being non-constructive ways to solve conflicts. Those will always be in our toolkit. Sometimes that's the only way. But I have hope that most of the time we can pause and find a constructive way forward. You know, if you disagree, you can pull my hair. You can smack me in the face. Right? These are non-constructive ways of solving things. You could bite me on the chin. I love this picture. But usually, you know, those kinds of brooches just really end in tears. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't make anyone happy at the end of the day. I don't know that it's necessarily solved the problem. People may have stopped talking about the problem, but I don't know that anything useful has necessarily come out of these kinds of approaches. This brings us to um, Drupal Drama. Now, I heard some chuckles. Um, hands up, Irvin, I just for the, you know, the sake of doing hands up those long-term members of the, uh, the Drupal community for whom Drupal Drama is, rings very, you know, like a bell. Yep. You know, we have, we have had a few over the time. I don't think we need to necessarily, I can repeat this one. Who wants to call out a kind of famous Drupal Drama that, that they're aware of? Just so we've got some common common language. Sorry? Rage quits repeated over and over. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any others? Who said what inappropriate thing during what presentation? Yep, absolutely. Any others? So, you know, some that went, went ended up going really well when we introduced the DrupalCon Code of Conduct. There was a first draft. There was a lot of um, gnashing of teeth and knitting of brows in the issue queue. I don't know if you can gnash your teeth and knit your brows in an issue queue, but let's just for a minute say you can. And then there was a second draft, which was then more widely adopted. So that was, an, that was one of those examples where, um, you know, it may have been quite a painful process to go through, but the end result was definitely a constructive, you know, a constructive outcome. Um, the Git migration was a, a honest kind of honest disagreement and debate, and that one, you know, perhaps wasn't so much drama, but just as a, you know, a really good process to work through. There's been some others where, you know, we haven't perhaps um, addressed and resolved um, the issues being um, being brought to light, and have ended up in a fork, such as backdrop. So there's a few, there are a few different things. And then there are sort of smaller micro, you know, between particular people or individuals that, you know, perhaps have ripple effects to others. They may not, the, the protagonists may not be aware of the impact they're having on others. So this is something that goes on in our community a lot in various shapes and sizes and degrees. And um, we've developed some governance and a community working group to try and... Um, to try and get around them. One of the key things, though, in the Drupal community is we have this, we really value consensus. We, we actually value it very deeply and we work hard to achieve it. We test ideas and we work towards finding common ground we can all agree on. And we work and we work and we work and we work until we can find that common ground. Sometimes to perhaps the... Um, the detriment of progress. Sometimes it leads to um, uh, stagnation. I've actually sl skipped a slide. The sense of, you know, wanting the same thing but not necessarily working together towards it. It takes a while sometimes to realise, oh, hang on, we can just both point in the same direction. Um, stagnation, though, is the flip side to consensus. When we can't reach consensus, we drop a lot of activity and energy on the floor. We lose a lot in this waiting for consensus that's never going to come. When no one's idea can win, we can't get consensus. Vast amounts of time and energy are wasted. When we, if only we could just have figured out a little bit sooner that we all wanted the same thing. The challenge is in when we don't want the same thing and we can't reach, and we can't reach consensus, what do we have? What do we get? Nothing. Yuck. 
it's just where to. Stagnation is not healthy. So how do we avoid this? How do we break these stalemates? Because I, mean, I think this is an important point is conflict isn't always, you know, raging wars, but sometimes it's, it's the very, it's right up, sort of if that's the yang, then conflict can be the yin, it can be silence, it can be ignoring, it can be absence of progress, it can be nothing. So that's, um, it's in, important to be as mindful of that as well. So one of the things we've had is the code of conduct. We've had it for a while now, um, and I kind of I couldn't even tell you what year we finally got it. We got a code of conduct. Greg probably knows off the top of his head. Um, and then later we added the Drupal Con code of conduct. So we had our code of conduct for our project and our online personas, and then we went through a process of having one for events such as this, um, and that's been around. But we had some unfinished business um, in the Code of Conduct. We had a to-do item, which was a conflict resolution process. Now, we got that on board last year. We've done that now, which is really you know, a real relief. And we've actually even had some test runs now and, and, and gone through the motions. And people are starting to understand that that process is around and exists and using it, which is really useful. So people are sort of saying, hey, you know, code of conduct and, you know, maybe you should have a chat about this offline if they're seeing things. So we've even got bystanders now getting active um, in this process, which is particularly um, gratifying to me because one of the things I've always wanted is a, is a Drupal peacekeeping force or kind of like a, a peace core for core. Um, you know, how do we keep the peace? And, and that is, that has to belong to all of us. Like when people have an issue with each other, let's not say, oh, it's just another Drupal drama. I'm saying, well, maybe there's something in that issue that means we really should stop and pay attention. Maybe there is an opportunity here to, to really move our project forward together because we have this underlying common common value and common goals in making Drupal awesome. How do we keep the peace? So uh, drupal.org slash conflict resolution is where that lives. And it's really, you know, it's really pretty simple. Um, just to go back a bit though, you know, it's the culmination of work begun by others. The community working group kind of finally brought it home, but it started with, um, with uh, a series of of blog posts that Randy Fay wrote about governance. Um, we, we continued some work um, at the first community summit in Prague. We brainstormed conflict. There was a whole lot of stuff. And I brought a document from my local state of Victoria. The, the Human Rights Commission had a, a, a conflict resolution process that organisations could adopt. So we brought a whole bunch of things to the table and we distilled it down. We ended up with, with this. A three-step process. Essentially, step one is to try to talk to each other. I mean, it doesn't sound like rocket science, really, does it? To see if you can just step outside that conflict for a moment and work out what that issue is between you. To pause the natural reaction. To pause the adrenaline response and just take a breath and say, hey, okay, let me really hear what your, what your, what your, your, what your problem is. What's your problem, right? <laughs> But to do so respectfully with compassion and to trust that you do have common ground, right? Have that conversation. It's not always possible though, right? If only it were that easy. So step two, ask someone else to mediate. Ask a trusted colleague or a friend, anyone, a bystander to say, hey, what do you think? Where I'm thinking this, so-and-so is thinking that. We're just not getting anywhere. Can you help us? Take that next step. Ask someone else to help mediate the dispute. And then the third one, should that also not work, is to reach out to the community working group. There are four of us. I'm the chair. Angela Byron, who was speaking in this room before me, has so many hats in the community. I can't believe she's on the community working group as well. George Demet um, and Adam Hills. Uh, we, 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 we meet weekly to discuss hopefully mostly policy stuff like getting a conflict resolution policy, uh, process in place, but also dealing with issues between members of the community who haven't been able to resolve it th through steps one and two. We have a, an incident report form where people can, um, can report issues that they're seeing. And we've seen people report their own issues and we've seen bystanders come and say, hey, these people are just at each other and it's not going anywhere and I don't think it's doing anyone any good and they bring it to our attention and so we can sort of step in and help. But again, there's only four of us. I really want this uh, Peace Corps for core. I really want more people to be able to understand this general approach to say, it's okay for us to have conflict. That's not the problem here. 
problem is that we're not necessarily skilled and resourced to deal with it in a way that's constructive. And that's my key thing here. How do we say, okay, conflict happens, fine. What's the opportunity here? And I think that could be really positive. At least I hope so. I'd love to see this army of empowered bystanders willing to help and maintain the peace, to stand up, to speak up. But I think we might need to skill up to do that. And so I've been looking at what kinds of tools we could use to do that. And then I need, the next step is, how do we disseminate that in a really useful way throughout our community? And that's, again, another opportunity for conversation. Like, I think there's a lot of things we could do. We can't do them all at once. We don't have the resources. But I think it's worth thinking about. Do other people think it's worth thinking about? Seeing some nods? Yeah. Cool. So... One of the ones, one of the frameworks for, for thinking about conflict, and this is just a sort of quick tour through um, some of the things I've been looking at, is the sense of the drama triangle. It's a useful model for thinking about interpersonal conflict. Um, there's a, a persecutor, a rescuer, and a victim. Um, hands up if you've ever found yourself drawn into a drama conflict and felt confused or uncomfortable <laughs> about what happened. There's a few hands, right? It's, it's a pretty common one. There's a chance you've been drawn into this sort of negative um, dynamic but, um, but not necessarily aware of it. It's a really seductive one and it's a common one. And it's actually one a lot of people have learned. And so it's, again, almost fits into that natural response. This is where I naturally go when I'm feeling threatened or in danger or upset or hurt or just pissed off. There's a flip side though and that's the empowerment dynamic. It's an alternative to challenge and create. So instead of what we had before, we've got a creator, a challenger and a coach. The victim becomes a creator. The persecutor becomes a challenger, pushing others to acquire new knowledge and skills and strive to be their best. And the rescuer becomes a coach, supporting and assisting and facilitating from the sidelines rather than getting sucked into the, I'm going to save you, which is also not a helpful response. And one the community working group needs to be really mindful of, that's not our job. Right. How do we do this in a way that isn't sucking our souls dry? Another one is this, um, I'm okay, you're okay. People heard of this one? Yes, some, two, nodding, others, no? So I'm okay, you're okay really talks about, um, helps you articulate different power relationships in sort of someone feeling superior and someone feeling inferior. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay and we're unlikely to have sort of um, a, an issue with each other. If I'm not okay and you're okay, I'm being sub subservient to you. The flip side is you're, um, I'm, I'm kind of talking at you, like what I'm doing right now, no. Um, is the parent voice is you should be doing right these kinds of things. And then the, you know, the, the, the really... Uh, negative one is where no one's okay. You know, I'm not okay, you're not okay. And it's kind of pretty, pretty lower, uh, not particularly useful. But it's a, it's a really good one. It's been around for a long time and there are some strategies there about shifting um, from the automatic response there. Nonviolent communication, again, is this one that's familiar to some of you? Hands up. Yes. Um, I've only recently become aware of nonviolent communication. It was kind of like, you know, the lights going on of a really useful way of, of talking and using language really powerfully. Um, you know, it, NVC is about um, being very, um, very mindful and clear about observations, feelings, needs and requests. And it was the request part of it that really kind of really worked for me in the sense of describing your own feelings, expressing your needs and making a request rather than a demand or... The flip side, leaving it totally unexpressed. It's like just a request. Would you be willing, you know, given you've made the observation, you've expressed the feeling and, and the need to then make the request of the person to do something differently? Matthew. That doesn't sound right. Oh, yes, thank you. See, NVC. Thanks, typo. So the slide is wrong. It should be CNVC for non-violent communication. Thank you very much, Matthew. And Barbara? Valerie. Valerie, thank you. 
So um, express your need and make a request. It's, a, it's really useful and I've got more reading to do on this and I think there are workshops. So again, in that skill up, maybe this is something that happens around the world. There are, might be workshops and stuff that local meetups could kind of get a speaker from to talk about how do we get more um, skill up our communication the way we skill up our tech skills, right? We go learn a new tool. Well, here's some tools. Another one is powerful non-defensive communication. Um, this, this I think, has learnt from NVC and taking it in a slightly different direction. And this one, this one really is, for me, is um, very much summed up in that sense of take a deep breath before you enact your natural response. Your natural response will be to defend yourself in some way or another if you're feeling attacked. So instead of just responding from that natural scent, that natural base, pause, ask a question, make a statement. And this is what like NVC does is observ observations, being very precise about what's happening, statements. Um, and then the final part of MV, uh, PNDC, uh, ask question, make statement and predict the consequences. So in this case, it's like um, if... If you say, if you do blah, I am going to do blah. Do you want to do that? Or if you do, if you don't want to do blah, I will be fine about that. You know, to make to create permission to do it. So there's this sort of sense of being really um, checking your response by asking questions, check your assumptions, be, get clarity before responding. Make statements about what you're hearing and seeing. Perhaps they're different things. Perhaps you're getting a response of I'm fine. Clearly, they're not fine. So you say, I hear you, you're saying you're fine, but I'm seeing you react and roll your eyes and shake your, you know, shake your head, and which suggests to me you're not fine. So it's being really clear about what you're hearing and what you're seeing if you feel there's a disconnect. And then there's predicting the consequences thing. Again, I'm only new to it, but it's really, um, it's really useful. And Valerie talked about surrender. Well, part of the other um, PNDC literature talks about different kinds of re, um, defensive response and surrender, surrender betray and surrender attack are different kinds of responses there. And surrender, surrender, just lay down. Yep. And there are, I think there's four others and there's a, there's a natural attack. There are a whole range of um, defensive responses which are really normal and just coded in language and ways of kind of checking those and responding differently to get a better outcome. And this one is um, DISCON, D DEFCON insult scale for conversations. I think this one's going to be particularly useful in our issue queues. This came out of um, uh, a talk by Jenna Likens from Red Hat at ApacheCon just like a few weeks ago. Um, her talk was called How to Thoroughly Insult and Defend People in Open Source. And when I saw um, some tweets about it, I thought, hey, that really, I think that dovetails in quite nicely with what I've been trying to do. And she has this um, five scale. So the first one is someone um, basically posts a bug report and says, so uh, here, here's a problem I found in widget five. Um, it, it's not quite working. And here's a patch that kind of fixes it. And so the maintainer of widget five goes, huh, looks at the patch, goes, Great, thanks. I'll uh, I'll commit that in next week's release. All good. That's green. That's discon one. Discon two is his patch. Huh. Thanks for the patch. Hmm. I see some problems here. I don't think this quite works with uh, the way we're doing things. So um, I think this needs to go back to needs work. That's two. That's blue. It's not too bad. There's nothing really wrong with that response. It's useful. But there's a bit of, there might be a bit more, could be a bit more useful with some feedback on how to make it better or what the roadmap is and how it should align. But this, this is all good so far. Then there's three, which is, huh, here's patch. Huh, thanks for the patch. Um, I think this coding is kind of stupid. Um, I'll take a look at it and consider maybe, you know, what, what we could do with it. It's like, hmm, it's not a super useful response, but it could be worse. And that is, hmm. Thanks for the patch. I think you're really stupid to really want to do this or take this approach. It's a personal attack there. Rather than attacking the code, it's attacking the person. But hey, we can take it to a whole other level, which is Discon 5, which is, you know, fire engine red. And that is, huh, thanks for the patch, you stupid idiot for 
trying to do this and I really rather wish you hadn't. You should perhaps go and die in a fire. <laughs> Bringing some kind of actually violent, you know, threat involved in there. It may not have been a serious threat. It may have not meant seriously, but it's sort of, sorry, Stick your head in a microwave, uh, yes, is another example. Another one I heard was um, die in a particularly unusual gardening incident. So, yeah, this is what we kind of want to avoid. But I wonder if it's useful to kind of have this kind of five-point scale handy when we're saying when we're looking through responses and issue cues and wondering why things are escalating to, oh, it's like, well, maybe people are using language which sets people... Uh, you know, up to feel attacked if someone's using that kind of language, if someone calls you stupid, if someone calls your code stupid, if someone then suggests you should stick your head in a microwave, die in a fire or uh, an awkward gardening accident, then you're probably not going to respond with, ha, 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 that's so funny. Some people do, and I think that's part of the challenge of our community. That there's an assumption that it's a joke, but for some people it's really confronting and hurtful. I've gone off on a tangent. But I'm close to the end now, and that is ultimately... You know, we need to work together to avoid stagnation and wasted effort and making people feel bad. Like, it's just not really good use of anyone's time. We need to embrace conflict constructively. It's fine to disagree. But rather than tear me down in that disagreement, can we build something together? I want us to build a culture of respect where bystanders are empowered to help. And Lynette was at the community summit on Monday and... You know, that was, to me, that, that was the culmination of this talk. It's like, hey, if you're doing more of this stuff, where do I find out about it? How do I get involved? Bring it on. Thank you so much. You know, where bystanders are empowered to help, where it's okay to challenge an idea to help make it better. That's what I'd like to see happen. Oh, that's what I'd invite you all to help us, you know, that we could build together. And I really like this quote. Whenever two good people argue over principles, they're both right. And this, I think, happens a lot in our community as we work with our project. We bring different ideas to the table. There's nothing wrong with those ideas, but we need to perhaps compromise to work together to get the best solution going forward. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be the best, most right solution, but it's one we agree on is, is, is useful, then we can move forward. Mari Ebner von Eschenbach. So ultimately we have, you know, less of this. Lots of, you know, holes blown in walls and destruction. And more, you know, happy sunflowers and fields of flowers that make us all smile, right? I just love this because whenever I put up a slide like this, everyone goes, ah, smiles. That's what I'd like to see, that we can uh, take on board that um, challenge and conflict is actually a useful thing and, and move forward. And that, my friends is my treatise on constructive conflict resolution. And I ask for constructive feedback at the end. Um, the, you can find it through the session schedule or the shortcut has got a node 219. Please, if you've taken um, an hour to be with me now to hear about that, then I'd really love um, your, your responses in the feedback. Um, some scores are good and comments are great. And if you want to continue this conversation with me even better, um, as I said at the front, um, I'm Kata Crab, and I can't get back to the front really quickly and easily, which is actually has that in case it's hard to spell. And there we go. Yes. All right. Cool. Um, we're right on six, so I'm quite happy to take questions. But it's also home time, so if you wanna, if you wanna get up and go, then please, please do. But um, thank you so much for coming. It was just really great, and thanks for sharing your thoughts.